Welcome to Crossroads Online. Thanks for being a part of our online community. To all the dads out there, we hope you had a very happy Father's Day. Here we're in week three of our series called Relentless Faith, looking at the life of Joseph. Happy Father's Day, Crossroads. Good to see everybody this morning. Good to see you guys this morning. Good to see you. My name is Brian. I'm a lead pastor here, and uh, I are a father. And so this morning, my kids got me an epic present. They got me their faces on a pair of socks. So look at that. Woo! So I'm going to hang on to these when they're older and I don't like them. I'm like, hey, remember when I liked you? They look just like that, right? You know? Hey, listen, so glad that uh, you're here with us, especially on Father's Day. I know it's not uh, easy to be a dad. I are one, like I said, but boy, I'm glad that you're here and uh, excited to have you with us today as part of our series. But listen, we're, we're in the middle of a series. It's called Relentless Faith. And I think that all of us as dads want to have a better faith. I, I would even go so far as to say all of us as men want to have a better faith. We want to, want to dig deeper. We want to be a better example to in our jobs, in our homes, wherever it might be. And, but in order to do that, we have to ask ourselves, who do we look to? How do we do that? And so what we'd love to do around here is to get together with other men, to be able to connect together, to, to worship together, to be able to just hear from God together. And it's a, it's a retreat called Revive that we do every year. This year we have got, I, I, I'm going to be there speaking, but we've got an unbelievable speaker that will be there to be able to connect with us in an amazing way. And so I wanted to introduce him to you today so you get to hear a little bit about him and have him uh, encourage you to be a part of it. So take a look. What's up, everybody? It's Remy Adeleke here, uh, former Navy SEAL, actor, writer, speaker, and uh, I'm going to be your speaker, one of your speakers, along with your pastor, uh, at uh, Crossroads Grace Men's Event this August. So I want you all to get your tickets. If you haven't got your tickets yet, go get them. If you got them, go get some other men to go get them. I got some powerful messages I'm going to share, and uh, yeah, go get it. Also, if you haven't got my book yet, Transform. Go get the book transformed so that when I come and speak and I share some stories, you know about all the stories already. So, yeah, God bless you. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you in August so we can have a good old time uh, for the Lord and his glory. So it's going to be a great, great time, um, and we want you to be a part of that. Remy is, a, I, I consider him a friend, um, former Navy SEAL, was in the movie The Transformers. He's a producer, writer, actor, just and to hear his life story of where he came and how he came in the Bronx as a boxer to get in the Navy SEAL, just unbelievable. You're one of want to be a part of that, uh, and we want you to join us. But also a couple things to know, you'll save some money by doing it before the 17th to save yourself 20 bucks by doing that. And if you're under the age of 18, special rate of $100. $125, 18 or under $125. You could go to the website to, do, to go there. All you have to do is put a deposit down in order to save your spot. As simple as $25 and be able to get you saved there. So go there, make sure you do that. Be a part of that. It's going to be a great weekend and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, but like I said, most of us want to have a relentless faith and that's where we're in the middle of right now. A, a series looking at the life of Joseph. And, and Joseph would have been one of those lives that a Hollywood screenwriter would say, oh man, that had to have been made up. That's just crazy. I couldn't even have thought of something as crazy as that. But it was his life. And every time we turn the page, we ask ourselves, how could more happen to this guy? But yet his faith became more relentless the more that happened to him almost. It's as almost like he said, bring it on. It's going to make me stronger the more crazy things that happened to him in his life. And if you missed the past two weeks, I'm going to invite you to go back to our website to take a look at that or the free app that we have. You can take a look at it there to see how we looked at faith and family and faith in injustice. Really good two spots to be able to jump in from. But we are going to be jumping in today in week three by being in Genesis chapter 39 and 40. So if you have your Bibles with you, you want to open them there, Genesis 39 and 40, or you can open up the free Crossroads Grace app and we'll be able to jump in there together. All the notes are there, everything for you. I'd love for you to be a part of it. But... I'm going to tell you a story to begin today. And the story begins um, really where this, this man must have felt like an, like an elephant stepped on his chest and pressed out all the air in his body as he felt that door slam behind him. 
I mean, a life in prison. Life in prison. How, how is it possible I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison? And for what? But yet on November 7th, 1962, that's exactly what happened. And for the next 27 years of this man's life, he would be shuffled between three different prisons. But he never once lost faith, never once lost hope that justice would be served and that he would continue to be able to fight for his people. And that's why when that door opened at Victor Verstier Prison in February 11th, 1990, and when Nelson Mandela walked out of that prison into freedom, the smile on his face could have only been from someone that had relentless faith despite what they were going through. But Mr. Mandela didn't stop fighting for his people. Once he was free, he continued to fight. In fact, he became the first black president of South Africa. And not only that, the first to be voted by a democratic election. But he continued to fight for his people, for the rights of his people, all the way to his death on December 5th, 2013, at the ripe old age of 95 years old. But he once said these words. He said that there is no easy walk to freedom anywhere. And many of us will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintop of our desires. So I ask you today, what do you do when you're in a situation that you don't deserve but that you find yourself in regardless? What do you do when the doctor says your wife only has one month to live? What do you do when your manager has all kinds of allegations against you that aren't true but threaten your job? What do you do when you hear that she breaks off the engagement? What do you do when your child that you raised to know the Lord forever all of a sudden comes to you and says, I don't believe that anymore, and walks away? What do you do? How does your faith withstand the punch to the spirit that those and oh so many more will inflict on you? Because if we could just be honest in the room here today, it is so easy, so easy to have faith when life is good. When the bills are paid, when the kids are thriving in school, when your marriage is at a 10, when, when, when you're in the best <clears throat> health of your life, who doesn't want to follow God then? Super easy. Who wouldn't want to follow him? But the tenacity of your faith is actually tested in the unfair times, in the unjust times, in the unbelievable times, in the unexplainable times. It's during those times that we really get to see the metal of our faith get tested. How relentless is our faith really during those times? See, Joseph, um, he was in one of those seasons. He could probably remember the rush of air as that door shut behind him. And all those air molecules must have felt like little razor blades going into each one of the pores on his bare back as it slammed behind him. Joseph knew. Once standing tall in the lap of luxury in Potiphar's house, now he stoops low in a prison cell because he wouldn't sit in the lap of Potiphar's wife. But now what? I mean, is this it? Is this how Joseph's life ends? Is this how he, 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 his epitaph will read, rotted away in a prison cell for a crime he never committed? Is that how it ends? Well, what he does is he finds himself in a prison, but he actually finds that his story is far from over, though. As we pick up at Genesis 39, 21, because we read, <laughs> the Lord was with him. Now, if you follow this story at all, you probably are wondering to yourself, are you kidding me? Come on now, God. You can't be telling me that you're with Joseph. And if you're Joseph, you've got to be saying, hey, God, could you be with someone else for just a little bit? Because your with hasn't gotten me a whole lot so far. So far, I've been beaten up, slowed into slavery, given into some man's house that I don't even know. I've been accused of rape, and now I am rotting in a prison cell. So thanks, God, but no thanks. I'm going to try to be without your with for a little bit. I love you and all. You're all good, but hey, bo go be with someone, because every time you're with me, I find myself in a mess. So what do you say? You go be with someone else, and I'll get out of this whole thing that you have placed me in. But you see, God's witness is so important for us to remember about Joseph, but also about our life. In fact, that the, the fact that God is not just with us during the good times, but the rough times is really critical. Because what I want you to know is that because the happy face God that shines on us only when things are going good horrifies me. Because that means that God has conditional love for us. Much like Joseph's father, Jacob, that loved Joseph more than as any of his other brothers, as we read, even bought him a coat to prove it. That's not really a God. If God acts like that, that's not a God I want to follow. 
But the fact that God is unconditional in his love and with his withness of us is so encouraging. And it tells us that no matter what you're going through, God is there. And let me say it again, that no matter what you're going through, God is there. Let let me say it one more time, that no matter what you're going through, God is there. God is with you. No matter what you're going through, God is with you. God is with you, but God is also with Joseph here. And because of that, his story continues. Look in verse 21. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, if you follow this story a little bit, you're probably saying, well, hang on. Did the Bible just copy and paste itself here? Did the writers get a little bored? Like, was the story just kind of, they wanted to repeat? Like, what happened? Because it sounds almost eerily similar to what we just read in Potiphar's house last week. Uh, Allow me to um, nerd out just for a second here. Let me explain this to you. And in, in Potiphar's house, we read that the Lord is with Joseph. Now in the jail, we say, but while Joseph was in here in the prison, the Lord is with him. We read that Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and became his attendant. The Lord granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. The warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. With Joseph in charge, Potiphar did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. It says the Lord gave him success in everything he did in Potiphar's house. The Lord gave him success in whatever he did in the prison. Isn't it fascinating to see that no matter what the circumstances Joseph was in, it never changed his approach to living. Whether he was in the palace or prison, Joseph worked for the same God that had granted him favor all those years ago. I I love what Gene Getz says about this whole thing. He says that Joseph's attitudes and actions throughout the whole ordeal were incredibly exemplary for one who had been so mistreated by his own family. And was now innocently incarcerated by the man whose trust he refused to violate. Joseph refused to allow his circumstances to influence his faithfulness. And God's faithfulness and God's blessing were with him even in the middle of that mess. Which this should scream to us today. That no matter where you're planted, make the decision to grow. Guys, listen. I think this is so important for us to realize, especially in our day and age... Because the truth is, is that the world that we live in is very impatient, but very particular about everything. It is a world of the three bears being lived out over and over. The porridge has to be just right before we're going to eat it. Case in point about this idea of having it just right is my wife's body temperature. Okay, right? She must be kept at a perfect 87 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit in order for my life to be even worth living at the point, okay, right? And, and the temperature gauge for this existence is her feet. It is her feet 100%. Because if those bad girls go cold, it is a long night, okay? You know, it is a DEFCOM 20 type of situation. Ain't nobody sleeping. There are blankets involved and hot water involved and, and heaters involved. My back gets called in from the, the minor leagues and she'll put those things on there. You hear this like, tss, like when it's on, like it just happens all the time until we get her in a homeostasis that is comfortable for her. Any other ladies with this foot syndrome that I'm talking about here? In the front row, we have a foot syndrome, right? You understand? You understand this. She has to be perfect in order for the life to be perfect. Where is this going, Pastor B? Glad you asked. Here's the thing. I see a whole lot of people that are so picky about where they're planted before they'll grow. They need the right soil, the right water, the right light, the right food, even even to think about them growing. But let me get us out of the flower bed and into reality. Consider this. I see a whole lot of people that refuse to work hard at their job until they are in a position they like. I see marriages that are waiting for Disney to come and sprinkle dust all over the top of their marriage to make it perfect before they'll work on it. I see guys that will look at their girlfriend or their wives and say, hey, you fix you. If you fix yourself, then I'll start to fix me. 
I, I see it happen all the time. I see parents that, that will take these uh, tech screens and then they'll hand them to their kids and say, okay, now this is going to teach you about life and I'm going to go play on my phone. I see it all the time. And what we miss out on is that God, we realize that God has us in this moment. We need to know that he has us in this moment, not by accident. We're in the soil that we're in because God is saying, grow where I have planted you. God says, grow even if you're on a crummy shift with a boss that you don't like, grow anyway. God says, grow in your marriage, even if it's hard. And don't wait for Disney to come and sprinkle you. Because if you didn't know, don't you know that every Disney couple in a movie dies? All of them die. All the parents. Look at any movie. I'm telling you, it's terrible. Don't do it. Hey, listen. Don't wait for that person to change. You change. And if you change, guess what? They might change along with you. Hey, don't let a tech screen, don't let a, a, a school, don't let a Sunday school, don't let a church class teach your kids. You teach your kids. Grow them yourself. Grow them up. God says, grow wherever you're planted. Joseph chose to grow. And as he grew, God used him and gave him more and more influence. Look what happens in verse 1 of chapter 40. It says, sometime later, the cupbearer, and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with these two officials and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. Now, <laughs> this is where the story gets all kind of weird and all kind of cool at the very same time, all right? So here, let me introduce you to some players that we have in the story. First up is the cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer's role with the king was a very unique one, but yet very important role. The cupbearer was in charge of tasting everything the king, the king ate or drank just in case it was poisoned, okay? And you thought that the kiosk at the mall with the hair straightener was a bad job, okay? This is a bad job. When every bite that you're about to take could kill you, I'll take the hair straightening job any day, okay? This is what we talk about, a bad job, but this is his job. But we learn another thing about the cupbearer from another uh, book in the Bible called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a cupbearer also. But what we find out there is that Nehemiah had a great deal of influence with the king and actually could speak into his life almost. So there was a, a high level of, of importance when it came to being a cupbearer. So that's number one. The other person that is in our little dance is the baker. Now, when you think of Baker, I don't want you to think of Duff Goldman Baker, okay? Like, this isn't like what we're talking about here, okay? The Baker was more like the chef. And the Baker would oversee all the food preparation, everything that happened. So if anyone was probably going to poison the king, is going to start with that dude right there. So that means that the cupbearer and the Baker were inextricably linked together whether they liked it or not. Because if I'm the cupbearer, I certainly want to know what's going in the meatloaf, if you know what I mean, you know? Like, I don't want any surprises, and so I knew who that person was. So, so clearly, something must have went wrong between the cupbearer and the baker, because they both were thro thrown into the clink. Now, <laughs> here's where it gets fun. Scripture tells us that Pharaoh was so angry that he had them reprimanded to the captain of the guard who in turn then put him in the same prison as Joseph and then also put Joseph over the top of them in charge of them. Now, why is this interesting? Because if you remember, the captain of the guard, the one that threw them in prison, put Joseph in charge of them, was none other than Potiphar. And Potiphar is the man that threw Joseph in jail for allegedly raping his wife. Now, why is this so fascinating? Because by this one act of trusting Joseph, it was almost a nod to him that Potiphar knew that his wife was lying. Potiphar knew that Joseph was innocent. But he also knew that God was with Joseph and anything under his care would prosper. Now think about this for a second. Imagine if you're Joseph and all of a sudden you see Potiphar coming towards you with these two guys. The man that threw you in jail is coming towards you. And your eyes meet for a second and he knows and you know that you're in this jail innocently. What would well up inside you if you were face to face with a man that placed you in jail for a decade for a crime you didn't commit? What would you say? What would you do? Joseph didn't do anything. Didn't say anything. Instead, we see Joseph continue to grow where he's planted. He remains relentless in his faith of God despite what he's going through. 
And despite all of that, an interesting opportunity presents itself. Look in verse 4. It says this. It says, And they had been in custody for some time. Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream that same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in the master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So one day, uh, Joseph is doing bed checks around the prison, and he goes over to the prisoners that he's in charge of, these high-profile prisoners, goes over to them. He can notice that they're a little dejected. They're a little bit down. Could have been anything, right? Could have been a bad day. They might not have got a lot of yard time. Maybe somebody, like, stole their honey buns from commissary. Like, I don't know. They just had a bad day in prison. It happens. But Joseph asks... And they confess to him, they're like, hey, we had some bad dreams. Now, most dreams that you have, you forget about all the time. But there's certain dreams that you have that will stick with you. Those ones that are just a little bit more intense. And you can even, you remember what happened, what you were wearing, what it felt like, what it tasted like. You could, you were there. You remember those dreams. These guys had one of those dreams. And the dreams that they had were so disturbing, they couldn't shake it. And no doubt they probably shared the dreams with one another, but the text says that it said that there was no one to interpret them. Well, isn't they, this is just a stroke of lucky duck luck right here because right in front of you, Joseph minored in dream interpretation while his mom was homeschooling him back in the promised land. How perfect is this, right? Look at that. It's almost as if God ordained it. But I want you to notice something very important here. Because when we first met Joseph in chapter 37, he was, he was describing these dreams to his brother, but never once when he was describing how they would bow down to him, never once do you hear him mention God. Not once. But now look at what he says to his fellow prisoners. He says this. He says, then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And all of a sudden, we get to see the spiritual development of this man, this Joseph, because when we first met him, he was 17, and his dad loved him, and he had a coat to prove it. Now, after a decade in jail and serving time, he has an orange jumpsuit and an inmate number to prove it. But through the injustice, through the nights alone, Joseph's faith grew in the waiting. He realized that God was with him, and anything he had was from God. It's almost as if he remembered this guy, Job, and what he had once said, that the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Joseph's response before interpreting the dream showed that he had already had this relentless faith, but it was still growing. And with this godly filter guiding Joseph, the cupbearer then decides to share his dream with him. Look in verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and it clustered, its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them in Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are for three days, and within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. So jo Joseph breaks down the cupbearer's like, like dream, and it's like, hey, listen, buddy, got great news for you here. Things are really going to look up. Three days from now, boom, back to promoted. You're going to get all the perks are going to come back, man. You're going to get your corner office, the 401 401k is going to come back, health insurance, no dental, sorry, but you're going to get pretty much everything back that you want. You're going to go back. All the privilege, all the influence in Pharaoh, you are going to get. It's just going to take you three days, so hang tight. And if you're the cupbearer, you start to think, Dude, I hope this guy's right, because that would be pretty awesome. Freedom, I'd love to go back to my job. I was good at it. Like, I love that. So if you're the cup there, you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm ready to go. But before Joseph puts this interpretation to bed, he actually says something really important. Look at verses 14 and 15. He says to the cupbearer, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph takes a moment in the middle of all this to ask for help. 
And if you're super holy here today, you're probably thinking, well, gosh, doesn't that show that he doesn't have a lot of faith? Maybe his faith wasn't as relentless as you think, Pastor B. Or if he had faith, wouldn't he just kind of let things play out the way that they should have played out? And see, I, I think this is where some people get a really skewed view of Christianity. It's some of these side factions of people that will say, oh, don't take medicines. Your, your, your faith will heal you. You know, it's wrong to fight back. Just be a pacifist. No big deal. If you had enough faith, everything would be fine. You know what? Mental illness, that's just a lack of faith. And when I hear that stuff, it drives me nuts. It upsets me so much. Because I know a whole lot of God-honoring physicians and doctors and nurses and scientists that, that use drugs and create drugs to help people by God's glory. I see the Bible full of battles where people are fighting for their homes and their nations and their kids and their families. I see it all over the place. I know uh, some of the most faithful people that I've ever met in my entire life go through some of the hardest things in their entire life. Guys, listen, I know a lot of godly people that have mental illness and through counseling and medication and faith, they are thriving. And so I also think that you could stand up for yourself in the face of injustice and not, have, and not be any less relentless in your faith. Guys, I just believe that Joseph saw this moment as a divine opportunity from God that God had presented, a chance to explain what's happened to him and place this information into the hands of somebody that could actually help him. But notice something here. He didn't interpret the dream under the pretense that he would help, that, that, that he would help him. He didn't say like, oh yeah, interpret your dream. It's going to cost you though. Didn't say that at all. Didn't say that one time. No, what we read is that Joseph had faith that the right thing would be done when he did the right thing. The right thing would be done when he did the right thing. And I think a lot of you right now, that just lifted some weight off your shoulders right there. Lifted a whole lot of weight. That fighting for what is right is not out of bounds of our faith. In fact, fighting for the things that are unjust in our world is actually the mission of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was constantly fighting for the disenfranchised in the forgotten. Think about this. As you look in the scriptures, never once does Jesus quiet the ones asking for help. He's quieting the crowd around the people so he can listen to the ones that need help more. That's what Jesus did all the time. Jesus was okay about hearing our voice. But listen, it takes two things that are very important, critical things that are too important when we talk about this. Number one is your heart. Your heart. The right message with the wrong heart might be heard, but it will not honor God. Wrong heart. Also, our timing. The right message at the wrong time will never be heard. Author Gene Getz again says that he says that the wrong timing often causes legitimate self-defense to appear defensive. Okay? Joseph's message, right time, right place, right heart, no issue at all. And so Joseph gave the cupbearer his message, but his work wasn't done because as he was in the corner, all of a sudden the baker says, you know what, let me tell you my dream. Verse 16 when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the, a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. And in the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole. And the birds will eat away flesh. You laugh because that wasn't your dream, right? You know, easy to do. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Baker wasn't expecting that answer, you know. He's like, hey, could we just run that around? I'd like that cupbearer thing one more time. Could we get that up in here? Like, that's what I want. But here's the thing. The three days that the baker was now facing were not filled with anticipation. They were filled with dread. What Joseph had just told him is that you are on death row for the next three days. But you know what? Even in this, the integrity of Joseph shows up. It's clearly on display that even with bad news, he didn't sugarcoat it. But he stands tall and he delivers the message that he was given by God. And as Christians, I think it is so important for us to have that in our relentless faith. That we can't shy away from the hard things of being a Christian or what God has called us to do. Because I just think, my personal opinion, that when we shy away from hard things, it actually weakens our integrity and our dependability in the eyes of others. I mean, if you and I are, if it's not important enough to you and I to stand up for it, to be confident in it, then why in the world would anybody else want to do the same thing? Because ultimately, we're not standing on our words. We're actually standing on the word of God. We're standing on truth. 
You see, we find confidence in the message God brought, not in the message we bring. It's God. Joseph wasn't making up stuff as he was going along. God gave him the interpretation. God gave him the message. And he was passing the information along as truth. But something is only looked at as truthful if it comes true. So what happens? Verse 20. It says, Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. And he gave a feast for all of his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. So can you place yourself in the scene with me just for a second? Like, it's Pharaoh's birthday. And so he brings all of his officials today to, together in, in one day for his birthday. And, and what, what, what better way to show your power and your influence than to drag a couple of guys that you threw in jail, you bring them out in front of all the party, and then with one swing of your hand, you say, cupbearer, you are now are back in your position. And he goes back into his position. And with the other swing of his hand, he acts like the queen of hearts from Alice in Wonderland and off with his head, right? Boom, done. And in that moment, Joseph was two for two in dream interpretation. Right there, two for two in dream interpretation. But here is where you start to think. Finally, Joseph, your life is going to turn. You nailed both of them, man. Now your life is going to turn. I mean, who in their right mind, if you're the cupbearer, wouldn't want to help Joseph right now? I mean, as you ascend back and you give Pharaoh his cup, you've got to be thinking, Joseph, man, like crushed it. You know, I mean, he said about the three days and the thing and the king and now look at Rob, like, I've got to do something. He nailed it. What can I possibly do? I've got to tell someone. And all of a sudden the audience with bated breath is leaning in and saying, What's he going to do? How's he going to do it? When's he going to tell him? What's the timing? How's he going to tell him about Joseph? And they're waiting. But then verse 23 comes and it says, The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Wait, wait what? Pastor B, you've got to get another translation. This one isn't right. Like, this possibly can't happen. He forgot him? How could you forget someone that did that for you? But he did. He forgot Joseph. And the Bible will tell us that it takes another two years before we even hear from Joseph again. But how is that possible? How could God allow this unjust act after unjust act happen to this one man? How much can he endure? Where is the pressure valve release that takes some of this out of him? And the answer is going to be surprising to us all. Especially in our need to have this pretty little bow on our world all the time where everything works out nicely. Guys, we just need to know that sometimes faith is messy. And the reward for your faith might be to remain in jail and minister to convicts and wardens. Sometimes our faith is to be asked to be present in waiting rooms and not in boardrooms. Sometimes our faith is to walk the, chronic, the road of chronic pain and not crowns and power. Sometimes our faith is rough and ragged and it hurts to touch. But it's still worth it. Because God is gaining value with each and every moment that you wait and lean in with a relentless faith. It will draw you closer to Jesus as you wait and as your faith grows even in the waiting. See, Jesus was a master teacher. Master communicator, leader, lightning rod of cultural influence when he lived. So you could, could you possibly imagine the political power that he would have if he aligned himself with the Pharisees, those religious people during his time? How much power he would have? Because that's what the people wanted. They wanted this king to come and overthrow Rome so the Jews would be elevated back to where they felt that they deserved. But Jesus didn't come to be in the public light. He came into private houses to visit people. He came to heal the sick and to, and, and to let the blind have sight and let the deaf hear. He hung out with the people that no one wanted to hang out with. He got on his hands and knees and played with kids. His, his mission was to, despite his circumstances, was to be down with us, to be patient. He, he waited patiently until the time had fully come, it says. Pastor Vody uh, Bachman says this. He says, Joseph's journey from Potiphar to prison is a reminder that God does not balance the scales in the here and now. He certainly doesn't always tilt them in our individual favor. 
He does, however, work all things according to the counsel of his perfect, immutable will, and he uses frowning providences to accomplish his redeeming work. Therein lies our hope. Waiting is hard. Let's face it, no matter where we're at, we don't like to wait. We don't like to wait in line. We don't like to wait in traffic. We don't like to wait for that person to come so we're not single. We don't like to wait for that baby to come when we really want to be a parent. We don't like to wait when the diagnosis comes back the wrong way. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. We want it Burger King. We want it our way. But my friends, I'm telling that waiting is where our faith gains the patience to persevere. And our faith is what is going to allow us to persevere the test of time. Joseph knew that because God was with him. And Jesus knew that too. In fact, it's so crazy to think about how Joseph and Jesus' life are so similar in a lot of ways. I always think it's important to know, like when Joseph was in prison, it wasn't like some easy white collar prison that he was in, like we make it out to sound. In fact, tucked in the book of Psalms, we read about what it was like. It said he sent a man before him, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass till the word of the Lord proved him true. Joseph was in a prison cell of injustice. He was been being treated unjustly. He was the face of injustice, was Joseph. But how interesting it is to look at how we describe Jesus in Isaiah. It says this, but he's pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. You see, Jesus suffered too, but he suffered for the unjust in you and me. Joseph was suffering injustice, and Jesus suffered for the unjust in you and me. And Jesus had to wait, because when he was on that cross, it didn't happen instantly. No, it took hours for that painful crucifixion to happen. And as his nails were, or as his hands were nailed and his feet were nailed, he took on the weight of the sin of all the world, past, present, and future. And he waited until the full weight was on his shoulders. He waited till all of it was on him. He didn't want to leave one ounce out. He waited and let it all fall on him until it all was on there. And then he said, It is finished. And he gave up his spirit. For the unjust in you and me. He carried the weight of sin on his shoulders so we would not have to be alone in our waiting. He carried the weight of sin so that we could be with the Father one day, that we could enter our eternity because of what Jesus did for us. So that all the waiting and all the pain and all the agony and all the questions can lead up to this moment of, oh, now I get it, Jesus. Thank you for dying for the unjust in me. Thank you for waiting until it was all on your shoulders. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we celebrate communion every week because of that. To bring our hearts back to Jesus. To remember that Jesus is always the greater Joseph. That Jesus is the one that we cling to in the dark times. That we hug in the good times. That we hold the hand of in the waiting room. My friends, I was in a waiting room just this yesterday. Waiting room with a family whose young 34-year-old daughter was in a room in an ICU bed who had had a heart attack and heart stopped, who knows why, but had six kids underneath her care and now she was inches from dying. And I'm there to tell you that in that room was the presence of God. In that waiting room was the presence of God to hold a family together that should have been falling apart. And as they remove life support and this young woman passes, the Spirit of God will be with them. And the Spirit of God will be with you in your waiting room, in your time of need. God will be there for you. And at communion, we remember why, because of Jesus Christ. Those tra trays will pass in front of you. You'll find two cups in there, bread in the bottom, juice in the top. 
Take them both out. Hold on to them. We'll come back to commune together. Let the words of this song wash over you as you hear this one line more than anything else. Hallelujah in the waiting. Hallelujah, you're my redeemer. Because in Jesus, he'll be with us no matter how long it takes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for this moment right now in front of all these people. I thank you for this chance to hear from your word. And we look at Joseph's life and we say, man, I don't know if I could do what he, he did. But I'm here today to tell this group that they can. Because the same spirit that was in Joseph is in this room right now. The same spirit that was in that waiting room with my friends is in this room right now. And I know, God, that there are people here right now that don't know you, Jesus, as a Lord and Savior. And they're in this time in their life, they're in this season, they're in this waiting room, and they're by themselves, and they don't know if they can make it. And they've been trying. They've been trying to buy it and smile, fake it through it. They've been trying everything they possibly can, but it's not working. But today, I believe that you will show them that you are the answer, that you will be with them in the waiting. And it's only through Jesus it's possible. So, Spirit, I pray that you move. And if there are people that are in the waiting room by themselves, that they would simply say, God, I need your son. Jesus, you died on that cross for me, in my place, for my sins. Take over my life. Come with me in that waiting room so that I'll not be alone ever again. And fill my life with newness so I can live. God, you tell us that if anyone repents of their past, embraces their future in there, that you, they are made whole. They're made brand new. So God, with this newness inside us, help us to endure this, gain this relentless faith. And for the rest of us, Father, might we just hear from you now. Encourage us, strengthen us with a relentless faith that won't give up because you're with us. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us online this week. We'd love to have you join us on campus if you can, but feel free to check out our website at crossroadsgrace.org or download our free Crossroads Grace app. These are great ways to connect with a member of our staff, find out what's going on around campus, or to give if you feel led. You can also catch up on all of the other weeks if you've missed any. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you have a great week.